uh, we will have an introductory talk followed by short presentations of uh, six papers. We'll have a short Q&A session after the third paper presentation, and we'll have a hopefully longer Q&A session after the last paper presentation. Please feel free to use uh, the chat room to post your questions or ask them directly during the Q&A sessions. The introduction will last for 15 minutes, and then each speaker will have eight minutes to present their paper. I will be uh, very strict in enforcing time limits because we're on a very tight schedule as this session needs to end at 5.30 sharp. Uh, at the end of the session, uh, this room will close and everyone will be automatically uh, transferred to the main room where you will be able to choose between the next two parallel sessions. The introductory talk uh, will be given by Alessandro Bonatti. Uh, Alessandro is an associate professor of applied economics at MIT Sloan. His main research fields are uh, microeconomic theory and uh, uh, industrial organization. He has worked extensively on the economics of data and is widely acknowledged as a world leading expert in this area. Alessandro, we're thrilled to have you with us today. You have 15 minutes for your introduction and then eight minutes for the presentation of your paper. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Yassine. Thank you so much. And uh, um, please do keep me on time on, on, on both segments. Uh, also, thank you to uh, the organizers. Uh, uh, Alex, Daniel, uh, Jacques, and Paul for, for thinking, me, uh, thinking about me for this. Uh, it, is a, it is a great honor. Um, it also goes without saying that yesterday was not a very easy day to focus, uh, at least in the United States. Um, but um, as we all know, um, data sharing and data markets matter for um, things also beyond economics. So, so uh, motivated by that, um, let's go. Um, I was... Um, uh, reminded, uh, thinking about the session of the catchphrase that data is the new oil, the economist has been running this for at least four years. Um, but um, it is ever more um, true and um, shaping wider and wider section, sectors uh, of the economy. And it's true that data sharing, which is the theme of our session, um, enables uh, the creation of enormous surplus for consumers and firms alike. Um, ratings, recommendations, uh, traffic directions, means of transportation, personalized results, tailored products, tailored uh, news coverage, but also for, for advertisers, custom audiences and various types of consumer metrics um, like scores or profiles. Um, there, are, uh, there are associated risks. Um, the product steering, we, talked, uh, we, we heard John talk about um, search results, uh, tailored prices, uh, election influence operations, addictive social media, and the um, ever more relevant and related phenomenon of um, echo chambers. Right? As, the, as the picture suggests, this uh, enormous potential uh, with, a, with an ambiguous sign uh, comes with um, incredible concentration of, of power, uh, market power, in, uh, in the hands of few platforms. We know which ones they are in the US, but possibly even more so uh, in China with JD, Tencent, um, and Alibaba. So I think it's useful to begin this, um, this session by thinking about uh, how um, market power and the success of these, um, uh, of these players is related to their ability to facilitate data sharing from consumers and for consumers. Okay, so, so, so let me take uh, a theory step back and think about uh, how you want to share data and how you do not want to share data. Okay. So uh, we often hear, um, at least in, in econ and uh, IO talks, um, about companies selling data. Okay. So I, we shouldn't, I should not take that too literally. Okay. Um, you could imagine um, Google as an intermediary collecting consumer data and then selling it back downstream um, to some firms. Okay. That type of model um, would run into a, a lot of problems. Okay? And they've been pointed out by Arrow in 1962. Okay? First of all, technically buying consumer information, quality is hard to verify. Second of all, once you've given the data in the hands of a firm, then they can use it for presumably a very long time. Okay? So, so this doesn't sound like a very um, successful business model and it's not the business model that they use. Okay? Um, most um, data is shared in the form of bundling services and information online, okay? where, uh, this is Toulouse, we all know that, those large players um, act as platforms with two sides, 
where um, users submit queries to the platform, think of sponsor search, and advertisers submit queries to the platform. Um, who do you want to target? Where do you bid? And um, the interaction happens on the platform or is mediated by the platform in a way that never makes the actual data ever change hands. Of course, the value creation is exactly the same because as a firm here, I would like to use data to customize my action, my price, my message to consumers. And I get to do exactly the same thing in the platform model by bidding for targeted keywords. Okay? I think this distinction is important for two reasons. Uh, one, to clarify what we all mean in this session when we say um, we're selling data, okay? Uh, we mean the second model. Uh, second, um, a lot of the key elements that we're going to see in this session are actually uh, central to this uh, indirect sale of information uh, type of business model that I should say is not even our invention, um, has been pointed out in the context of finance since at least at Matty and Flyder uh, in 1990. So what are the main themes of the, of the session that we're about to, um, uh, to participate in? Um, one is that there's a lot of potential and value from combining data. And combining data is going to be a, a feature that plays on at least three levels. One is statistics. Can I merge two data sets and learn more from them? Another one is strategy. How should I leverage additional data? And the third one is regulation. Should it be allowed or should it not be allowed and to which extent? The second one is that the platform's market power uh, manifests itself to consumers through, uh, let me say, the advertisers or whoever buys the data. Okay? Platforms monetize the data on the advertiser side, which means that a lot of the implications that are going to come for consumers are actually through something like um, the pass-through rate of advertising costs okay? or the implications of putting data in the hands of, of firms. Okay? And third, but in some sense first, um, even in my, uh, in my earlier diagram, uh, the information must be sourced first. Okay? So uh, consumers' privacy, privacy preferences are going to matter for this um, and for the amount of data that is endogenously available. So these three teams, combining data, uh, market power, you know, essentially exerted through the, um, the buy side of the data, and privacy preferences matter. These are the three teams that if I were you, I would look for uh, in all the talks or in most of the talks uh, that we're about to uh, see in this very short format. Okay. Now, let me spend the remaining, um, I guess, seven minutes on um, talking a little bit about the um, uh, slight details of the, of the papers we're about to see. I'm not even going to try to summarize them. I will not do them justice in, uh, in, in 90 seconds per paper, it seems. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem optimal. Okay, so here are the, the, the catch titles I'm going to uh, fill in a, a network graph or something like that. Um, but I'm going to start with, um, uh, with Tessary's paper on, on privacy, privacy preferences. Okay. At, at the end of the day, you know, we're all interested in, in data and in observing market outcomes. And, and her point in the paper is that it's really hard to infer pri privacy preferences from realized market data um, because we don't know um, whether the consumers with the most at stake opt in or opt out or the ones who are most privacy conscious and have an intrinsic preference for not revealing their, uh, their information. Now, she will tell you all about how she uh, set up an experimental study uh, to separate the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, model of preferences in a way that is, from my uh, ignorant perspective, impossible from, uh, uh, from actual uh, market reduced data. Um, but my favorite feature of, of this paper is that it can actually then estimate the gains from trade in the context of the experimental setup from trading data. And in the experiment, there are you know, users deciding whether to reveal their information and, and, and a firm that's going to do something with them. Okay. And so the, the main result there for me is that um, acquiring data from consumers to build a model and then to leverage it, say to set prices, uh, does not generate positive gains. What does generate enormous gains from trade is acquiring data from a um, sample of consumers, a very small number of them, using it to build a model and then leveraging it for, with everybody else, which is, of course, what you would do in A-B tests and the like. Okay? So this highlights the presence of a data externality across different agents. This data externality is going to come back in my talk, but I, I, I don't want to uh, advertise it now. I'll come back to it at the end. What it does 
is that it relates to the paper that Alex uh, will present on data and product targeting in a, in a very different sense. Okay? In, in, in Tessary's paper, this externality is across users. Uh, in Alex's paper, it's going to come across markets. So um, Alex's paper is one of two in this session where we're going to be essentially looking at information structures in the hoteling model. Okay? Um, in um, Alex and Uli's paper, um, two firms on the hoteling essentially line compete in prices and product varieties, uh, and they have access to differently informative signals about the consumer's location. And the, to me, the, the key uh, element that, that, that he will emphasize is that better signals allow you to offer better targeted products. Um, but if you have worse signals than your competitors, then you're going to have to cut prices. What does this have to do with data externalities and, and um, uh, across markets? Well, is that if the signal precision is endogenized okay, and one firm has an exogenous you know, advantage from a different market to capture more data about its own consumers, well, the resulting equilibrium is going to be asymmetric, meaning one firm is going to have very precise information and one is going to have very imprecise information with interesting um, implications for consumer welfare uh, that we'll talk about maybe later. Um, but the asymmetric nature of what we will see emphasizes how combining data, not from one consumer to the other, but from one market to the other, can, uh, can be a, a barrier to entry. So uh, Alex's paper, you can almost view it as a uh, micro foundation for one step in what Daniele is going to present, um, where, um, where it's a, it's a paper that doesn't name too many names, but it's essentially a, a study of, of Google Fitbit and what, what we can uh, learn uh, from that. And um, it shows us how a, um, a firm in a, um, in a large primary market can use a data intensive unrelated secondary market to um, deter entry into, into its own ground. Okay? So it's almost like using Fitbit data as a barrier to entry. And the idea being that if you're Google operating in an advertising market, you can supplement your data with, with the Fitbit data from, from a secondary market, not to um, offer better deals or monetize Fitbit's users, but to uh, protect yourself and your core business from, uh, from entry uh, in, say, in targeted advertising. So a key question that that's going to be prompted and, 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 and Daniel and Jorge are beginning to study it is then how does competition unfold uh, in the primary market here? And, and a key distinction here will be whether the Fitbit data gets merged with the Google data or gets siloed. Okay? And that is, again, a statistical uh, and a strategy question and also a regulatory dimension. There is tangential work on this topic by uh, Daron and co-authors and by, and by, by Shota Ichihashi, uh, but, you know, um, competition with, with different uh, levels of data here. It's, a, it's an open topic. So at this point, we've seen how externalities and combining data across consumers and markets can generate a ton of value and, and also have rich welfare consequences. And, and the last two talks um, in, in my uh, uh, distinction here are going to be about um, what are implications for consumers when prices are essentially strategic. And there are two very related papers that use two very different methods. Okay. So, so uh, Richard's paper um, is, uh, if anything, bringing a, you know, a fresh modeling uh, device, at least to me, to, to this IO theory uh, topic, uh, where it's a, it's a directed search model on and off a platform. And um, data sharing by consumers makes the platform more attractive. Okay. What happens at this point is that um, better data and better matches um, are going to lead to externalities through a different channel, through the channel of product market concentration. Okay? And, and the story there is going to go the, along the lines of if the platform is more attractive, the advertisers are captive because all the consumers are there and the advertisers have to go there. Um, and that's going to mean that um, in a free entry world, they will have to, um, there will have to be fewer of them and demand, you know, they're more concentrated, they'll get better trades, terms of trade with the consumers. So this is one way in which um, we can come back to that point of the consequences of our consumers coming from, from the other side. Okay. Here, better data squeezes advertisers and leads to greater market concentration. Okay. You could say exactly the same thing in a market with, uh, with sponsored search, where uh, the platform would offer better matches at higher prices. And then again, 
the question of, uh, of pass through would be critical to what uh, would be the consequences for, uh, for consumers. Um, I think this is a fruitful area of, of research. You know, there's an empirical paper by uh, De Carolis and Rovigatti that so at the end connects to this, but it, it's not a, it's not a, a direct match. And, and, and last but not least, um, Antoine's paper is also going to look at uh, selling information to competing firms and implications downstream uh, with, a, uh, with an information structure that you know, is very dear to me because I call it course cookies from, from an old paper that I had with Dirk, um, where uh, essentially firms are, ena are enabled to identify specific consumer types and then pool everybody else. Okay. The innovation in, um, in Antoine's paper is to compare very different selling mechanisms, auctions, uh, negotiations and take it or leave it offers that really get at the heart of should information be sold exclusively or not. There's also not Martin Flyder a reference there to an even earlier paper um, about um, you can't sell information to a Bertrand competition because there will be no gains uh, exposed. Okay, so the finding here is that when the data is very precise, then it gets sold exclusively okay, via an auction for exclusive access. And so here again, we have a connection between the amount of data that gets collected and whose hands it's going to go to and what are they going to be the implication for consumers. Again, I could say the same story here with uh, selling each consumer point by point up here um, and then looking at the, um, at the implications of raising the marginal cost uh, of advertising. But those are just different channels through which um, this um, idea that uh, the welfare effects for consumers is mediated by data buyers um, is going to come. Okay? So those are the three the themes that, that we're going to see. Uh, the data must be sourced and the privacy preferences, be them instrumental or, uh, or not, um, matter. And um, combining uh, various kinds of data, exogenously, endogenously, endogenously priced or just information acquisition, all the papers are different of course, but, um, but that is, um, I think that is the starting point uh, for, for where I, I, I think this literature uh, is going. So um, I am very much looking forward to the, uh, to the other five talks. Uh, Yasin, how are we doing on time? Uh, well, time for the introduction is over. Okay, so okay. let me just move on. Yes, please, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, I have mentioned data externality a couple of times, and of course, uh, my own under uh, my own reading of, of, of all of your papers is uh, is shaped by by what I've been thinking about. Um, the, the paper with uh, Dirk and Tan Gan, who's a graduate student at Yale, uh, that I will present, uh, that I am presenting, is um, is entirely focused on this idea that correlation in traits across consumers um, can lead uh, simultaneously to a loss in privacy if this data changes hands and to a gain in information because I get to learn from you. Okay? Of course, this only happens in the context of a platform that mediates information. So the picture here at the bottom is small, but the idea is that there are gonna be many consumers who will trade information really in this indirect way, but let me not, let me not say it again, uh, with, um, with a platform that will send information back to them in the form of recommendations. Uh, on the other side, the intermediary is just going to sell the data uh, to advertisers. And then at the bottom of my triangle here, um, at the base, uh, the advertiser is going to have an interaction with the consumers, which will be informed by the data. Okay. I'm about to tell you a story of price discrimination, but that's really to give you the easiest illustration thereof. You could plug in any, any other game you want. Okay. What's the key economic force? It's an externality. So there's a wedge between you know, social efficiency and, and equilibrium outcomes. Uh, the wedge is given by the fact that consumers are only compensated on the margin for the consequences of revealing their data, in a sense, given that everybody else is already doing it. Okay. So we will highlight two types of market failure, intermediation of inefficient data and lack of intermediation of data that would be actually profitable and sorry, efficient to, to intermediate. Okay. The more um, distinguishing feature I, I think of our paper is that we want to think about what kind of data will get endogenously intermediated. Uh, will it be aggregate or will it be personal? Okay. And um, the main result that I won't have time to, uh, to go into any details about will be that this platform will optimally choose 
to sell anonymous or market level or aggregate data, uh, they're all synonyms in the model, uh, if and only if that intermediation is inefficient. Okay? So that while on the one hand, we are gonna obtain inefficient intermediation in general, the aggregation level of the data will be, uh, will be socially efficient. And not only that, it will drive increasing returns in sample size and sort of provide a foundation for how and why we think that these uh, platforms have a, um, an advantage in acquiring uh, humongous data sets. So let me, um, let me tell you um, a little bit more um, about the model. Okay. So um, in the model, we are going to try and be as detail-free as possible while maintaining quadratic payoffs. So really we're going to be thinking about um, a joint distribution of consumer types, okay? But also incomplete information on the consumer side, okay? So each consumer has a type, these types are correlated, that's why there is externalities, uh, but we only observe informative signals. Okay? Signals and their errors can also be correlated. We can all have the same biased um, uh, impression of the value of a new product, okay? And filtering out the noise will be the source, um, the source of value. Okay, this is going to be cast in a world where my type is the intercept of my demand, but I don't know my own demand uh, intercept at the onset, and the producer could charge personalized prices, but they don't know uh, they don't know our demand functions. So in the data market, the uh, um, information of the consumers is going to be supplemented. Um, how uh, each consumer can agree to sell their data, their signal ex ante for a payment. And the producer who's gonna buy this data uh, can also pay a fee and access a data outflow policy. The data outflow policy means how much data does the firm get and what recommendations for buying do the consumers get on the other side, which of course is also payoff relevant for the producer. So, how is the, uh, the data going to be used? Well, I'll use the data and the recommendations to update my type. The firm will use it to update their beliefs and charge personalized prices, okay? That's, that's sort of the illustrative example. Let me just tell you two things, which are, what are the key modeling choices that we, uh, that we see um, as crucial and as descriptive of this environment? And then and there's a summary of the results and, uh, and I'll be done. What are the modeling features that we insist on and that are important? Okay, so, so I'm de-emphasizing this price discrimination aspect because again, you could plug in any other game. One, that any information beyond the common prior is held by consumers. So again, it must be sourced before it can get used. Two, the data can create value for consumers by teaching them about their own preferences. Okay. So um, it could be that we all have the same type. And so by learning your signals, I learned something about my type. It could be that we all make the same mistake and by learning all your signals, I can filter out uh, the error and, and by difference, I can learn my type. At the same time, uh, the social data can be exploited by any data buyers. Okay? So the price discriminating monopolist is a, is a classic example, but you could have all the other uh, negative features that I mentioned at the beginning of my introduction. Okay. And then the third feature uh, that, um, so, it's not ubiquitous, but, but, but I think is representative, is that participation constraints um, hold ex ante. Okay. So I don't decide whether to uh, adjust my posts on Facebook depending on my type, but I do decide on average whether the terms and of, you know, of service and conditions are fine for me and whether I use the platform or not. Okay. So with these essentially four um, key um, uh, ingredients, then um, what do we do? We look at the contracting game between the platform and the consumers. We show that those MI or MI stars, the payments that go to consumers are actually only determined on the margin where consumers are compensated for individual harm that data might cause to them, but not for the, for the social one. And we show that the cost of acquiring information vanishes while the gains persist as the market grows, even if the total effect of information is to reduce social surplus. So that's a pretty bleak picture. It's just saying uh, there's very little chance and in this market with externalities and market power, you're going to get an efficient allocation of data. Then we, you know, uh, we, we, things become a little bit better once we look at the optimal uh, data sharing policy because we find that it's actually more profitable for the um, platform to induce uniform prices rather than personalized prices 
and to give personalized product recommendations if, if we extend the model in that direction. Why is it optimal to you know, forbid price discrimination by mediating aggregate data? Um, the wrong intuition is that, oh, you're protecting the consumer's privacy, therefore it's cheaper for you to buy this data. That's true, but it's also true that the firm is willing to pay less because it's less precise. So that can't be it. Um, the reason is that um, aggregate data makes the consumer signals more substitutes. And because you're only compensated on the margin, that makes the marginal compensation you know, proportionally smaller and makes uh, intermediation therefore more profitable. Okay. It remains that um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on the, on the, on the policy side and on, on, the, on the regulation side and on the market design side uh, because we do get socially efficient anonymization but not socially efficient uh, intermediation decisions. Alessandro, I, must I think I'm gonna to... leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can you wrap look up? forward to the rest of the papers. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're now moving to our next talk. Uh, the next speaker is Antoine Dubu from the Free University of Brussels. Antoine, the, yes. the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, so thanks Alessandro for um, your very nice introduction. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for attending the presentation of my paper, Market for Information and Selling Mechanisms, that I've been co-writing with David Bouni and Patrick Walbrook from Telecom Paris. And in this paper, we deal with the issue that um, access to data is providing firms a very strong competitive advantage, and in particular, their uh, the starting point of our research was that um, in 2018, it was revealed that Facebook was providing several firms with a very um, uh, specific, uh, special access to data. And so uh, this was giving these firms a very strong competitive advantage, while um, other, um, other firms were denied this very same access. And so by doing so, Facebook was uh, shaping competition in markets. And so it is, I think, one of the many reasons why in 2019, the German Competition Authority team decided to prohibit Facebook from combining uh, consumer information from several sources. And by doing so, there is this uh, recognition that controlling access to data, which is usually done by a data protection agency, actually will also help restore competition in markets. And so there is this strong relation between access to data and data protection and market competition, and we are uh, actually investigating this relation in, uh, in this paper. But what we do is that we show that this uh, one-way relationship is actually both ways, and that if you control for uh, market structures, and in particular, we will focus on um, the selling mechanisms, you will also have an impact on the profitability of data, and thus on the incitations of firms to collect consumer data, and thus on market competition in turn and consumer privacy. And so what we do in this, um, in this art paper is that we consider several selling mechanisms and we see how um, the strategies of consumer data collection and consumer data sale of intermediaries are changed with different selling mechanisms. And so to give you an idea of uh, what we consider in this paper, we look at uh, the following now classical uh, representation of the market for consumer information. We have a data intermediary that collects uh, uh, key segments of consumer data, and uh, then it will recombine these segments and sell it to competing firms that will then use it to optimize our interactions with consumers. So in our model with price discrimination. And so what we're interested in, in it's uh, the relation between um, the data intermediary um, and, uh, and the firms, and in particular, how information is sold and how this will impact on the one hand, the amount of consumer data that is collected by the intermediary. And on the other hand, how it will impact consumer surplus and competition in the downstream market. And so we'll, uh, like in the paper, we consider a more general representation of any selling mechanisms, but for the presentation, we focus on three of them. So I'll take it a little bit to first, sequential bargaining and first price options that are, that are commonly used now in the, in the industry. And what we do is that for each selling mechanism, we look at uh, the number of consumer segments that is optimally collected and sold in equilibrium, and then we compare them for each selling mechanism. So the timing of the game is uh, the following. First, we, um, with the data intermediary, we choose how many consumer segments to collect. So I will define in the next slide what K and G are. Then in the stage after, the data intermediary will sell information strategically, and then firms with or without information will set prices and compete. And so the way we represent information is uh, using a standard hodling competition model, where firms are located at the extremities and uninformed 
about firms' location. And a data intermediary, so here a data broker, um, has a representative has information that allows to segment the unit length into, into key segments of size whenever key. And so uh, with this information, the data intermediary can recognize whether a consumer belongs to one segment or the other. And so uh, this allows to have information. And so the number of consumer segments key is actually a proxy for the precision of information because with more key segments, uh, you, you have finer segments and so you can recognize consumer uh, more precisely. So this is for the data collection uh, stage, but also the intermediary will sell information strategically. And that is, it will sell an information structure that we describe um, at the bottom of this slide. And more, for instance, here, it will sell to Aeroflot all consumer segments up to a cutoff point and nothing afterward. And why is this partition optimal for Aeroflot? Well, because uh, consumers with a high valuation are identified, and this allows to extract uh, this surplus from this uh, uh, high willingness to pay consumers. But the more segments are sold, and the higher competition will be on the market, and this will um, lower the price set by the other firm as a reaction, and this will lower the ability of the informed firm to set high prices. And so there is this threshold after which selling an additional segment will increase competition too much, compared to what you can expect from uh, more surplus extraction from consumers. And so there is an optimal gene. So with the three selling mechanisms that we consider in the, in the article, the J will be the same for a given precision K, but actually in the general formulation, we see that this J can be a strategic element that is uh, chosen by the intermediary to optimize its revenues. And this will also be linked to the level of, of competition in the market. And so to uh, jump to the results, um, what we show is that actually the selling mechanism has a strong impact on the amount of consumer segments that are collected by the intermediary. And in particular, as you can see here, the consumer data collection is minimized in take it or leave it offers and maximized with the sequential bargaining mechanisms. And you have an inverse relationship with a consumer surplus. And actually you can see here that the data protection agency willing to minimize consumer data collection we would rather have the take it or leave it mechanism. And it's the same for a competition authority willing to maximize consumer surplus. But then if you turn to what's uh, uh, chosen by the industry, take it or leave it offers is usually, usually not what's preferred because it minimizes the profits of data intermediary. And so a conclusion of uh, our model is that you have this strong uh, potential um, conflict in view over um, uh, what is best for the industry and for regulators. And uh, as um, that in, uh, the selling mechanism will have a strong impact on the amount of consumer information collected and sold, but also on consumer surplus, there is this, um, this tension between, between what, what is chosen by the industry and what would be chosen by uh, regulators. And so um, now if you look at selling information to both firms, the information partition has the same feature as before. And with this idea that a share of consumers is left unidentified uh, to firms so that com competition on the market remains a bit low and this increases the um, profits of the firm and their willingness to pay for information. So you have the same mechanism as when selling information to one firm. And um, we show that for the three selling mechanisms, only um, in take it or leave it offers, the intermediary wants to sell information to both firms. With two, the two other mechanisms, selling information to only one firm is preferable because um, selling information to both firms lowers the price of information because it increases too much uh, competition in the market and just decreases too much profits of the firms. And so um, it's another conclusion of this research that selling mechanism has a strong impact on uh, which firm can uh, acquire information. And in particular, again, the key it offers is preferred by regulators because it, it allows to have a fair and equal access to information and a higher competition in the market. And so um, finally, in uh, regulatory tools that we explore, one uh, stands out, which is open data, which has been uh, proposed by several reports and uh, scholars. And um, we show that in, a, in all setup, open data would uh, go back to the same equilibrium as the one in uh, Take It or Leave It Offers, where uh, both firms compete fiercely and uh, have a, there is a fair and uh, equal access to, to uh, information. And this is better for, for consumer for their surplus, but also it minimizes consumer data collection. So. Um, this is the end. I'm happy to answer any question if you have some. Perfect timing. Thank you very much, Antoine. Uh, we'll take time for questions uh, later, but for now, let's uh, move uh, to our next talk. Uh, our next speaker is Tesari Lin from Boston University. Tesari, the floor is yours. Right. Um, thank you, Yasin. So um, I'm going to talk about measuring consumers' valuation for privacy. And uh, here I will distinguish between the intrinsic and instrumental preferences. 
And also, uh, um, so the paper also uses the variation of privacy preferences as an entryway to understand consumers, sorry, uh, the firm's data collection and inference strategies. Now, the distinction between the intrinsic and instrumental preferences was first proposed by Gary Becker in 1980. So the intrinsic preference is a taste. People may value privacy regardless of any particular economic consequences associated with data sharing because they uh, associate privacy with personal freedom and autonomy. You can see this in the recent contact tracing example where people seem to be intrinsically averse about the idea to be checked. Now, the instrumental preference is more familiar to us as the, uh, the concern that revealing one's private information to the firm may lead to negative economic outcomes. For example, a risky driver may be very reluctant to share their driving history to an insurance firm. However, a safe driver may be pretty okay with doing so. Now, why is it useful to empirically tease apart the intrinsic and instrumental preference? The first reason has to do with selection. So in the previous example, we can see that a model with pure instrumental preference will predict that consumers who choose not to share the data are mainly the low types, meaning that these are the drivers or the consumers who will otherwise get negative economic outcomes upon revealing their private information. However, such insight does not necessarily hold when consumers also have heterogeneous intrinsic preferences. For example, suppose safer drivers actually uh, intrinsically care about protecting their location information more than the rest of the population because they feel more strongly that letting the firm know about where they are at what times is creepy. In that case, we should expect that the set of people who choose not to share the data may be stati uh, statistically tilted more towards the safe drivers. So empirically characterize the respective heterogeneity of the two preference components is going to help us better understand this selection pattern. The second reason has to do with endogeneity. So the intrinsic preference is a utility primitive, but the instru uh, instrumental is endogenously driven by the ability of the firm extracting the insights from the data and how the firm is using the data to uh, deliver targeted payoffs. So measuring the respective magnitude is going to help us understand, for example, uh, the impact of a new policy shock or a technology shock or uh, it can also help us understand when the firm's data usage strategy changes, for example, when the data collection strategy changes, how would the uh, weather or to what extent the privacy choices actually respond. So um, in the paper, so well, this is what I'm going to talk about for the, uh, for the sake of time. So first I will talk about how I use an experiment to empirically separate the intrinsic and instrumental preferences. I will show you uh, the reviewed preference measure and uh, how the dollar magnitudes. And I will also show the heterogeneity across different demographics. And then I will show how the structural model that I estimate is going to back out consumers' belief on the instrumental outcome as the utility primitive. In doing so, it takes care of the fact that the instrumental uh, outcome itself is endogenous. Then I will show you briefly how the empirical selection pattern is driven by the uh, heterogeneity and the correlation between the two preference types. Now, uh, one of the, I guess, one of the very part of the paper, which uh, Alessandro also mentioned is the uh, data collection strategy, which takes care of this uh, information externality. However, for the sake of time, I'm not actually talking about that. So I'm uh, very grateful that uh, Alessandro actually summarized that part at the beginning. So uh, let me give you a very simplified version of consumer's utility model. There are actually several components that often get confounded with each other, um, especially in observational settings. So I want to show you why they are different and how my experiment is going to help in teasing them apart. So think of a consumer that gets a request from a firm to share their personal data. The decision is binary and involves the trade-off between the privacy costs and the benefit from sharing. So here you see actually there are three components. The intrinsic preference, the primitive, the instrumental preference, which is in induced by the targeting scheme, and then there is a additional benefit term. So this compensation is the, what the firm offers to the consumers before the firm knows the private information of the consumers. So for example, it can be a one-off discount that the firm offers to encourage the drivers to adopt a UBI device. 
the conversation is independent of the private information because at that point, the firm doesn't know about the consumer's private type yet. As a result, it's very distinct from the instrumental incentive, which is always a function of the consumer's private information. So the experiment will solicit reviewed preference for privacy from the consumers by requesting the consumers to share their responses to sensitive personal questions. I will turn the instrumental incentive on or off across treatments by, uh, by using a bonus term that the firm offers. So this bonus term is a uh, additional term when the firm learns from the data that this participant is a likely customer based on their income profile and their enthusiasm about the product that the firm sells. In doing so, I will be able to tease out the intrinsic and instrumental preference. In addition, I will independently vary the compensation term. This is a price for data that is the same across participants. So then I will be able to translate the preferences from the utility space to the dollar value space. So for the sake of time, I will show you three sets of results briefly. First is the uh, intrinsic preference distribution. So this is uh, the intrinsic preferences across different personal data requested, which is along the y-axis and among the consumers, which is, uh, is along the x-axis. And the scale is in terms of the willingness to accept. A wider spread of the distribution here indicates more heterogeneity. So you can see that, for example, uh, a consumer at the 95% quantile often value their privacy intrinsically more than twice as much as consumers at the median. I also find meaningful variation of the privacy preferences uh, among different demographic strata. For the instrumental preference, what we are interested in is what does consumer's belief looks like and whether it's consistent with the actual targeted incentive scheme that the firm offers. Now, why do we care about this? It is this belief scheme that ultimately de uh, determines the scale of the instrumental preference. For example, suppose an insurance firm gives vastly different contracts to different types of drivers, but the drivers are actually not aware of that. In that case, the instrumental preference would have been zero. So my estimation result shows that the consumer's beliefs are first order consistent with the actual payoff. Um, there's a caveat here though, which is that the estimation results are based on an information environment that is relatively transparent. And lastly, uh, we want to understand how the two preference component jointly uh, determines the empirical pattern of selection into data sharing. Now it turns out what matters are two things, which one is more heterogeneous and what is the correlation between the two components? For example, if the two are positively correlated or when they are independent, then we see that classical prediction holds, which is that the set of the consumers choosing not to share the data are more likely to be low types. However, the opposite selection pattern may hold when the two are negatively correlated and when the intrinsic is more heterogeneous so that it dominates the selection pattern uh, indicated by the instrumental preference. So to sum up, consumers care about privacy both intrinsically and instrumentally. The heterogeneity pattern and the magnitude shown here uh, has implications on data collection, which is that the firm will only find data collection uh, feasible by leveraging this additional uh, data externality among the consumers. And my paper also talks about how uh, a inference, so from a, st a statistical or econometric standpoint, how to design better methods to analyze consumer data that account for the selection pattern. Um, I think that's all from me for now. So thank you. Thanks very much, Desari. So let's move to our next speaker, uh, Alex Gambol from TSE. Um, project is called Data Product Targeting and Competition is joined with um, Uli Hege. It's a uh, research in, in progress, as it were. So um, I don't need to motivate the general uh, topic of the paper, uh, just to say that um, this issue of um, how data is used this increased access to data is used. Um, a lot of the, the research that uh, has been done on this uh, looks into data enabling price discrimination, and that's obviously a very important issue. What we want to do is move a little bit away from that and think a bit more about how data can be used for pro product targeting. That is how to actually tailor a, a product offer um, on the basis of uh, available data. And uh, what we are then interested in is, of course, to understand how this affects uh, competition, 
um, incentives for data collection, incentives to provide uh, data and possibly regulatory implications. So what I'll present uh, here is really the basic uh, model and some of the economics that go on with in it um, without going too much into kind of the, the extensions and regulatory implications. So the model is incredibly simple. We just have a consumer with a unit demand and an unknown taste. So this is uh, like a hoteling uh, line of infinite size. And there are two firms who get independent uh, noisy signals about this uh, preferred location of the consumer. And the size of the interval, so they basically learn in which interval the uh, true taste parameter lies, but they don't know where within that interval um, the, the, the preferred specific product specification eater lies. Now, based on this uh, information, the two firms simultaneously choose a product specification and a price. So there's no first choosing location and then learning from it and then setting price. So it's a simultaneous game where you choose the location and uh, the price uh, at the same time. And the con so pro production costs are normalized to zero and the consumer's utility from purchasing from firm I is just a valuation that's a common knowledge parameter um, in this model, V minus the, the distance between the actual product that's being offered and the preferred specification and the price that you need to pay. So that's, that's the model. So it's really uh, very, very simple. Now, what are the economic effects that are going on here? So, Let's think about what happens if you improve the information of one firm. So that means you make the interval uh, smaller where the, the true realization of the preference uh, may, may lie given your information. So you improve the information of one firm, what happens? Well, on average, both firms will now offer more similar products because they actually know more precisely what is the preferred product of the consumer. If they offer more similar products, they end up competing more fiercely with each other. So more information actually makes competition uh, uh, fiercer. There's a countervailing effect to that, which is that if you give one firm better information, then it knows that it can tailor the product better. So it increases consumer capture. So it allows th that firm to increase the price and still sell with the same probability if you want. So it can afford to increase the price. So there are two effects that go in opposite directions. How do they pan out in equilibrium as it were? So we distinguish between what we call an information laggard. So this is the firm that has less precise information and the information leader who has more precise information. And the laggard will charge a lower price in order to compete against the um, dominant or uh, information, informationally superior leader. But what's interesting here is that the improving the laggards information actually reduces both firms prices. So the effect A here, if you want, is, is dominant. So competition gets fiercer. But um, if you improve the leader's price, this has an asymmetric effect. So it will actually improving the, the leader's information will increase the leader's price. So effect B will dominate, but will reduce the laggards price. So what's the effect of this? on uh, profits and consumer surplus. So if you have more data, then this always improves the available choices for the consumers because products will be more, uh, will be better tailored. What it, if you give more data to the laggard, the market becomes more competitive. So that's good for consumers, but bad for profits. If you give more data to the leader, then the market actually becomes less competitive in the sense that the expected purchase price that the consumer ends up paying actually increases because this effect of um, the information leader charging a higher price will um, come through here. And this is obviously bad for the consumer, good for the leader and bad for the laggard. So they're quite nuanced effects if you want uh, going on. Overall, more data will always improve consumer surplus and also total surplus. Um, but as I showed before, uh, and I want to just uh, show this briefly again, it's the effect on profits is not that straightforward. So if you think about the incentives for data collection, if you're the information laggard, so this is the, um, the profit line in this segment here, then more information is actually bad news because it makes the market more competitive. You actually prefer not to have that information because it allows you to, if you want to uh, end up coordinating on a, on a lower price. Now, the only time when that is not true is if, the, if we're not talking about marginal changes in information, but a real jump in information. So you can, if you want, leapfrog 
as a, as an information laggard to jump from being a laggard and actually becoming an information leader. So if you can improve your information a lot, then this may be uh, desirable uh, for the laggard. Just uh, briefly to compare well, um, this with Monopoly, actually the incentives to provide information are quite different. So in Duopoly, the consumer always wants to give more information because essentially this improves the average product offering and makes firms, broadly speaking, more competitive. So this is a good news. In Monopoly, that's actually not true. So in a Monopoly, you have a hump-shaped consumer surplus with respect to information. It's basically because here the consumer trades off on the one hand um, a better product with better information, but also ends up being uh, subject to more uh, stronger price discrimination and that effect may dominate. Now, maybe the one result we found quite surprising is that total surplus in monopoly may actually be higher than in duopoly. And the reason for that is that um, when the laggard offers, because the laggard offers a lower price, sometimes he, he has, ends up selling a product even though it's less well uh, tailored than the competing product, and that's an allocational inefficiency. You, of course, have to trade that off against the increased uh, choice that's available when you have two firms with two signals making an offer. But in particular, the monopoly dominates when the additional firm that enters, if you want, is significantly less well informed, because then you have very different prices and this allocational inefficiency uh, may be important. Now, this is the basic framework. I'll also stop here, but just to say we can use it in a number of directions to, 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 to think about various extensions. One is to think about data-driven mergers, so you combine the two signals in, in one firm, and this may increase total surplus. We can think about the um, predatory uh, effects of, uh, of data um, to destroy profits of a competitor, if you want, and thereby deter, or force, deter entry or force exit. And we can think about cross-market learning, where we show that uh, firms may actually offer biased products, um, but may do so at lower or higher prices. So this effect can go in either direction. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. OK, great. So thanks to the organizers for having us. And thanks to Alessandro for a wonderful introduction. Um, this is joint work with Tomas Philippin. So I think by now, the, this introduction is uh, redundant. Um, but uh, it goes without saying that uh, large internet platforms have fundamentally changed the way you know, market participants interact. And one reason for this is because they gather and analyze large amounts of data from both consumers and sellers. And of course, there's a ver there are a variety of benefits and costs to this, some of which have been discussed in some of the talks so far. So in this paper, we're gonna ask three related questions. Uh, the first is how does data gathering affect buyers and sellers interacting on the platform? The second, uh, is there a role for regulating data collected by platforms? And third, how do new internet platforms differ from traditional retail brick and mortar ones? As a preview of the answer is, well, the, as to how data get, gathering affects buyers and sellers, we're gonna focus on one set of benefits and costs. The benefits are going to be the enabling of better matching on the part of uh, buyers and sellers. The costs are going to be the increase in market power of the platform relative to sellers, and I'll describe this in a second, which leads to a preview of the answer to the second question as to whether there's a rule for regulating the platforms. And it turns out because of the latter effect, um, regulating data can have the effect of reducing the market power of the platform relative to sellers, which in turn incentivizes seller entry and then benefits consumers as a result of that. Finally, as to how new internet platforms differ from traditional ones, we find that this need for regulation arises only when the data processing capacity of the platform is particularly large. And what we argue is this is exactly what distinguishes newer platforms from older ones. So let me briefly talk about the implications for regulation. You know, as we know, there are currently two largely separate regulatory measures being taken against platforms. You know, on the data side, there's GDPR, and of course, there's a bunch of recent antitrust measures being taken in both the EU and the US against platforms. And our paper suggests that these two measures should be closely linked. In particular, in our model, the ability to gather data contributes to the rising market power of the platform. And so consequently, the regulation of data collection may have the benefit of increasing competitiveness. Let me give you a brief overview of the model. It's sort of a standard platform model that you've seen so far. So it's going to consist of buyers, platforms, and the sellers, and this other trading venue, which we call the outside market. 
it's a static model. And the first thing that happens is that buyers decide whether to search for a new product in the platform or the outside market. Conditional on participating in the platform, they make a simple disclosure choice that tells the platform some data about the, their tastes. Next, sellers decide whether to sell the good on the platform or the outside market. If they decide to uh, sell on the platform, they have the option this data from the platform. And uh, finally, buyers and sellers interact on either the platform or the outside market. So buyers are pretty simple. There's an exogenous mass of them. They have uncertain tastes across varieties I. And we're going to model this pretty simply. So they're going to have taste U for some variety where U is positive and zero for all other varieties. They make an information disclosure choice in the platform. And this information disclosure choice is this delta between one vari and delta bar. And this disclosure choice is going to be associated with the signal with the property that the probability that the signal value is I conditional on the true value being I is delta. Okay, and on the outside market, there's no such information revealed. Uh, sellers can sell one unit of good uh, on either the platform or the outside market. They have an entry cost kappa. They purchase this data on the platform and this price is going to be determined via bargaining. I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Uh, once they have this data, they decide which, ver which, ver which variety to produce. On the platform, they're going to end up producing the correct variety with probability delta. And in the outside market, because there's no additional information, they just uniformly pick a variety. So the probability they get it correct is one of I. And finally, buyers and sellers are going to interact in competitive search markets on either the platform or the outside market. So the platform consists of a matching technology and a data processing capacity. The matching technology here is simple Cobb-Douglas. So if there are NB buyers and NS sellers, the probability that the buyer meets a seller is just alpha bar n to the one minus gamma, where little n is just the, uh, the is market tightness. The data processing capacity essentially captures the maximal precision of the signal. The, the platform can compute. So higher data bar, is a high delta bar means that a more precise signal is feasible on the part of consumers so they can get higher precision. And uh, they sell this data to sellers and the data here consists of the information disclosure choice delta and the realization of the sig signal sigma. The outside market is just associated with the simple Cobb-Douglas matching technology. So pretty similar to the platform. But the key thing is that the match efficiency, alpha bar O, may be a little lower than that of the platform. That's the only potential difference between that. But the key other difference is that there's no additional data collected here. Okay, so competitive search in the platform is pretty standard. If there are NS sellers and NB buyers, here are what payoffs look like for the buyers and sellers. The key thing to note is that both payoffs have this direct effect of being increasing in delta, which is this match efficiency but the buyer's payoffs are increasing in tightness and the seller's is gonna be decreasing tightness. And the key property that's gonna determine results in our model is how this endogenous market tightness moves as a function of the information disclosure of Delta. So bargaining between platform and sellers is simple Nash bargaining. So here theta is the weight on the platform. And here you can see the price is determined by this simple formula, which is pretty standard. The key thing determining this price are the outside options of both the seller and the platform. And this is kind of crucial to our results. So let me get to what these, these outside options are. So for the platform, we think of these outside option as, you know, think of Amazon basics. So the idea is that instead of selling this data to sellers, the platform can use the data and produce the good itself. And this VM of Delta is a payoff associated with that. The key thing I want you to note is that this object is increasing in Delta. So as more information is revealed by buyers, the outside option of the platform increases, which sort of increases their bargaining power. This is what we call the copycat effect of information. For the sellers, the outside option is to sell in the outside market. And the key thing to note here is that the seller's outside option is actually decreasing in Delta because as Delta increases, fewer buyers decide to go to the outside market. And so that reduces the the seller's payoffs. So this is what we call the customer access effect information. So the punchline is, as Delta increases, outside option for the platform increases, outside option for the seller decreases. Which leads to a key equation in the paper, which is what is the relationship between data and market power? So here's the payoff of the seller of interacting on the platform. There's sort of two key effects I want you to take away. The first is this match efficiency effect, which I talked about earlier, more better data enables better matching. But the second is a sort of increase in market power of the platform relative to seller due to both the customer access and the copycat effects. Okay, and this discourages seller entry. 
So consequently, you know, the effect of Delta on seller entry and hence market tightness is ambiguous. And what you can show is that N is actually decreasing in Delta if the bargaining power theta or gamma is particularly large. So given that, when we go to the information disclosure choice, we that it's a simple exogenous cost function, lambda of delta. What I want you to take away is that buyers do not internalize the effect of disclosure on market tightness. So they do not internalize the effect of delta on N, which is exactly what the difference is between the buyer's problem and the planner's problem. The planner, in addition to taking into account the private marginal benefit of delta, which is the first term in this equation, also takes into account the effect of disclosure on market tightness and internalizes that higher delta can actually reduce seller entry and lower buyer surplus as a consequence. So that may be a reason for why it wants to regulate. Now, uh, that's so in particular, the buyer wants to restrict information disclosure if the derivative of this equilibrium market tightness at delta B, which is the equilibrium delta B, is less than zero. And this turns out to be true when delta B is very large, i.e. when a lot of information has been collected by the platform. And this is exactly what we want to say is what distinguishes newer internet platforms from older ones is that the ability to collect so much data that you're sort of on this decreasing part of this market tightness so that uh, regulation may be necessary. Okay, and with that, let me conclude. Thank you very much, Rishab.